Hello everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel, and if you're new, hi, welcome, my name is Daisy, and this is my channel, Chess with Daisy. Um, I was going over 40 of my games to see what I've been doing wrong in all my games to try and improve my rating and pinpoint exactly what's keeping me from reaching a higher rating, and I've noticed that a lot of the times it has to do with advantage capitalization. What's happening is I'll gain an advantage, but in some way or another, I'll be losing the advantage. So I thought this game was a perfect example of that because I went all the way into the end game and where I reached a winning position, but I didn't know how to convert it. So it combines both end game themes and advantage capitalization, which was just perfect. So this game started off with d4, which personally I hate playing against because I like it when white plays e4 so that I can play the Sicilian. I played d5 and bishop f4. So this is called the London system after bishop to f4. This is a great opening for beginners to grandmasters, and it's also become just very popular at the grandmaster level in recent years because of its simplicity and its ability to gain a positional advantage. And for beginners, it also teaches the development of the minor pieces with a good middle game plan and just overall a comfortable position. And I'm not up to theory with really any opening, but I do understand that the rules of the game don't change regardless of whatever opening my opponent plays. So while I'm not comfortable with the London system, I know that I can't be worse if I develop my minor pieces and I castle and I perform a lever as usual. If my pieces become active, I'll at least have a good game. So I played bishop to f5, e3, e6, h3, h6. Overall, h6 isn't a very good move, but it's not a really bad one, so it's fine. a3, and then I played bishop to d6, and this is the start of my advantage because this follows the principle of trading off your opponent's most active piece. The bishop over here on f4 was white's most active piece, and now I'm going ahead and I'm trading it off with my bishop. So the bishop moved back, and I decided to trade it off. The bishop should have traded for my bishop right away, um, because then there wouldn't be any weaknesses in the pawn structure, but this was a mistake. I see a clear way to have an advantage in the endgame with this pawn structure after I take. When you're in the opening, plan for the middle game, and when you're in the middle game, plan for the end game. Chess is really a game about planning, so you want to try and build your advantages even if they seem like they're not coming in the near future. Now white has two pawn islands, and g3 is weak. It's a weak pawn, and it can be picked off easily. Also, e4 is a weak square, and very easily my knight could jump into that weak square and cause a lot of damage and overall just be very well positioned. So I did play knight to f6 following along with that plan, but queen to d6 was definitely a better move because it was more active. So my opponent played knight to c3, and I castled, knight to f3, just normal developing moves. And then finally I did play queen to d6, and I attacked the pawn, knight came to e5, blocking the attack on the pawn. I played knight to e4. Maybe knight to c6 would have been a little bit better because I would be gaining a tempo on this knight because this knight has moved twice and this knight has only moved once. Therefore, it would be like I would be gaining a move. But my move was fine. It just wasn't best. So then the knight captured. I captured back correctly. White played queen to d2 and I played knight to c6. f6 was slightly better because it gains a tempo on the knight and because it keeps my pawn structure intact after all is said and done. But I opted for knight c6 which helped with my rapid development. Both moves are fine, but f6 was for sure a little bit better. So knight takes, and in this position, what would you do? So think for a second. What would you do in this position? Now, it seems like the obvious move is to maybe take back with a queen or even take back with a pawn, but really the proper move is queen takes g3 check. Now, this is a crucial in-between move because it picks up a pawn and it picks up a tempo on the king. In-between moves often become the deciding factors in almost all games, so you should always be on the lookout for in-between moves that you or your opponent can make. The queen went to f2 to block the check, we traded queens, and then I recaptured my material back. And as you can see, I am up one pawn, so this will be helpful in the endgame. White's bishop went to d3, again following the principle of trading off your opponent's most active piece, and I decided to trade because I evaluated this endgame as winning for me. Why do you think this end game is winning for me? Take a second to think. Well, the answer is because white has three pawn islands and these two pawns can potentially be weak, whereas I have two pawn islands, although my A pawn and my C pawns are weak, 
But overall, the black pawn structure is better, and you can see that from the evaluation, because even though I'm up a pawn, it should be minus 1.0, but it evaluates my position as almost a half a pawn more. Here I played rook to b8, but this definitely wasn't so great. It was fine, but it wasn't best. And what I'm trying to do is find the best moves because that is overall how I'm going to improve my play. Because there's a very small difference between a player that's, let's say, rated 1400 versus a player that's rated 1600, but it's a difference nonetheless. A lot of times a player doesn't even make a big blunder. It's just one player is making good moves and the other player is making great moves. And that's what we all strive to do. A5 is the best move here because it prevents white from playing B4. And now if white can play b4, it clamps down on the c5 square, making this c5 pawn push almost impossible. And it also further weakens these doubled pawns. But I decided to target this pawn. But if I was going to play rook to b8 and we're going to be nitpicky, the f rook was probably the best rook to do that because this rook on a8 reserves the possibility to play a5. White played the obvious b4. And a5 is actually still possible here, and it's still strong because it puts more pressure on white's position and losing the pawn is only temporary because those weak pawns, they're gonna die. In that case, there will be two double isolated pawns over here, two doubled pawns over here, and just overall three pawn islands and not a lot of pawns. But I opted for rook to b5, and this wasn't best, but again, it was okay. You'll see that the evaluation bar, yes, it changes, but it's not like I made a terrible blunder. White then plays rook h to f1, a5 finally, and if you were playing white, what would you do here? So take a minute to pause the video and come up with an endgame plan for white. So what white did was play rook f to b1. Now, this wasn't a bad move, but what's the point behind this? Sure, you're activating your rook, but it doesn't really have a clear plan. Instead of playing rook to b1, white actually should have just abandoned the a pawn and gone after my weak c file and my weak pawns on the c file. Because a wise man named Steve once told me in a chess tournament, activity above all else. And I was in a similar endgame like this and I was totally winning, but then I allowed my opponent to get counterplay and I lost. And now let's look at rook to c1. So although rook b1 wasn't a bad move at all, rook c1 was definitely a better plan because it, for one, the rook is picking up a tempo here. For two, if we continue normally, let's say rook to a6 just to defend the pawn, the rook will come to c3 and it'll laterally defend this pawn and prepare to double up here and it still maintains the pressure on c6. So if you can accomplish three things in one move, it's gotta be a great move because if you can even accomplish two things in one move, it's probably a good move. If we go back, I played rook to a8 because I wanted to double up on this pawn Rook to b3, c5, this was a great move because my doubled pawns are now gone and now I'm also better. d4. Do you want some? Some pretzels? I would love a pretzel. <laughs> you want yours out. I only want one. Thank you. Oh. I want to be in the seat. <laughs> you want to say be... hi? Hi. <laughs> And I ended up going back to a5 to continue my pressure on this pawn, but there was actually a better move. If I go back, rook to c2 is a much better option than my move, rook to a5, because it picks up a tempo and it prepares c5, which will absolutely destroy white's pawn structure, along with white's hopes and dreams. Because if we envision this, let's say the king moves out of check, and we play c5, and d takes, and rook takes, and look at this position and tell me who in the world is willingly taking white. White that has four pawns and three pawn islands. So I'm going to fast forward the game a little because this isn't the position that I want to focus on. But also notice that my pieces are doing a very good job of blocking this white king from going anywhere into my territory. I don't have a lot of holes in my position. And here on h4, I correctly decided to ignore the threat. C5 is a really good move because C5 pretty much um, eliminates all my problems. And again, the pawn structure is just completely destroyed after this. So now I'm for sure winning. And as you can see on the evaluation bar, it says that I'm winning by two full pawns, even though I'm only up one pawn. And then white played pawn to A4. And this brings us to the heart of the actual lesson, which is about advantage capitalization. And I played rook to A5, which was not the best move. 
Too often in life, we forget to seize the moment, and this move was another one of those moments. I had a better move. Can you find it? Take a minute to pause the video and look. The move was rook to c4, attacking both these two pawns at the same time, and white can't save both. It would secure the win of a second pawn, and most likely the game as well. That's actually the end of the lesson, but I will fast forward just in case you guys want to see the ending, because it kind of has a funny ending. You know, that G pawn, it's been, it's been bothering me the whole game, so this is what I played in the game. At least I got that G pawn, because I really hated that G pawn. But also, just remember that I always curse my rooks. So if you take my rooks, I've already casted a spell on you, and you'll never be a master. Masters have never taken my rooks. Also, masters never play me. But basically, this is how this game ended, and it ended with a blunder. But really, what the key idea was over here, instead of playing for this and pressure on this pawn, what I should have done was this. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching, and stay tuned for another video next Saturday. Bye!